Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all for the nth seminar in this series of uh, ICM virtual seminars in computer and computational science. Uh, my name is Marek Michalewicz. I'm the director of uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling. And uh, we are very privileged to have uh, great speakers in our seminars. Before moving to seminars, I have a few short announcements. Uh, quite soon, on July 19th to 23rd, we'll be running the seventh uh, mm -hmm. edition of uh, Supercomputing Frontiers uh, Conference, Supercomputing Frontiers Europe. Uh, as you see here on this uh, slide, we uh, managed to, to uh, invite uh, uh, very uh, important and uh, uh, people in the field of uh, supercomputing. Uh, the speakers will be Anders Jensen, who is the executive director of Euro HPC, uh, Irene Quarters, who is the director of uh, computational sciences, Los Alamos National Labs, and uh, we'll have Roberto Carr. And uh, for, uh, who's professor of uh, at Princeton University, famous for Carparinello method, uh, and uh, Kitano san, who is, uh, founded the uh, Systems Biology Institute in Tokyo. Uh, so, uh, this, these are just uh, keynote speakers. I can assure you that the, the lineup for invited speakers is equally uh, great. Uh, we haven't announced uh, them yet, but uh, we have the full list and uh, so please await uh, f further announcements if i may have a second slide so i can move them myself so now so uh, as as usual uh, this uh, series of seminars uh, uh, is supported by our sponsors especially uh, international uh, national information processing institute in warsaw uh, and various me media partners, Datanami, ITWIS, HPC Wire, Computer World, Forum Akademickie, Enterprise AI. Uh, the topic of today's uh, lecture is, uh, is very important for, 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 for everybody, of course, but uh, I, I, I wish to inform you that the uh, ICN has been uh, very deeply involved in research on uh, COVID-19 uh, for the last at least 14-15 uh, months. Uh, I invite you to visit the uh, COVID-19 uh, web page at, at our uh, web portal, where you will have uh, three separate areas of research or, or, or information for that matter. And uh, uh, in this series of seminars that we run for, for over a year now, uh, last year in May, uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Aneta Affelt, presented a fascinating lecture on the promises of One Health concept in the age of Anthropocene, which was uh, very firmly focused on, on the origin uh, of uh, COVID-19 and how, how we came about it. And uh, uh, finally, we also have uh, the, the very intense effort led by Dr. Franciszek Rakowski uh, to build and maintain age, agent-based uh, model for coronavirus uh, dynamics in Poland. And this model, which has been worked out by a group of, of uh, more than 12 people for, for the last 14 months, 15 months, is used by Ministry of Health, is used to, to, to guide, sometimes uh, inform decisions of the Polish government, Minister of Health and the various uh, crisis uh, organizations in Poland. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, one of, of many of a series of seminars we are I think, I think uh, to its 18th uh, in, the, in the series. And uh, please, if you're interested, uh, go and check our web page, website. Uh, all of the seminars are recorded and we have uh, we had uh, very famous personalities uh, like uh, Stephen Wolfram speaking at the, at the seminar series. So uh, you are most welcome to, to, to browse and, and if you're interested, um, listen to those uh, lectures. And today I have a great pleasure of uh, welcoming uh, Professor David Winkler, Professor of Biochemistry and Genetics at La Trobe University. Uh, 
professor of medicine and chemistry at Monash University, visiting professor in pharmacy, University of Nottingham, and fellow in evolutionary robotics in CSRO Data 61. And the title of the lecture will be Computational Insights into the Origin of SARS-CoV-2 and Repair Person of Drugs for COVID-19. But before letting David uh, speak, I, I wish to, to say a few words uh, of a personal nature. Uh, we've known uh, each other for, for over 30 years, I believe. And there was a period of, of our lives that uh, we sort of uh, worked on, on, on the series of papers on uh, interpretation and, and experiment of uh, involving elect electron elect uh, inelastic scattering on molecules in the wonderful collaboration of people from the University of Flinders, University of Melbourne, Australian National University and CSRO. And as you see, the list of here is just partial list of papers who co-authored together. So I'm very, very pleased that sort of old collaborator and, and sort of a colleague from CSRO is uh, speaking today. Incidentally, I've, my master's degree is from Atrope University. I've done uh, my degree there as well. So, so it's, it's a very sort of personal and close connection. So I'm very, very happy to welcome uh, David today. And with that, uh, well, uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Marek. Um, I've just got to work out how to share my screen here. Um, okay, good. Well, it's a great pleasure to be able to give a talk uh, to this uh, institution. And as Marek said, we worked together for quite some time, a long time ago. Um, we haven't really seen each other for probably about 30 years. So I'd actually forgotten how many good papers we've published together. So it's a, a great privilege to, um, to be able to talk to you about some recent work we did on um, on the origin of the virus, which is very controversial and topical at the moment, and also on trying to do something about um, helping people that are admitted to ICU and so on by repurposing drugs. Um, so, as Marek said, I work at a number of different places, um, fractional appointments in a number of places, and interestingly, these um, places all have quite strange looking buildings. There must have been an architectural blitz or something going on at the time. Fortunately, a couple of these places, like the previous one, Monash University and uh, the pharmacy building at Nottingham, these are two of the really top pharmacy groups. So it's a great opportunity to work with them. I think they're in the top 10 in the world. Um, this is the new Monash New Horizons building, which Marek probably hasn't seen. Very uh, space age. And then at La Trobe, I work at um, what's called the Limbs One building, which again, probably wasn't there when Marek was at, at La Trobe, but it's great to have these new facilities and exciting facilities and some really good people in these um, buildings to work with. So as we all know, um, we've got the worst pandemic we've had for a hundred years. If you look back at the Spanish flu at the top there, there are about estimated about 500 million cases and probably between 20 and 50 million deaths. And if you look at the bottom, you can see with COVID, we've only got 3.5 million deaths, but I suspect in some places, particularly places like India, that the deaths may be underestimated and possibly other countries. So we may be getting up to um, something just as severe in terms of deaths as we had with the Spanish flu. There's a number of other scary diseases that have broken out as epidemics in the past. Some of these horrible hemorrhagic diseases like Marburg and Ebola and Hendra. Hendra is a, an Australian um, hemorrhagic disease that broke out um, some years ago, but fortunately was uh, restrained before it only killed more than one or two people. But you can see the numbers of cases there and the, and the the number of fatalities is quite low, which is good because the fatality rate for some of these things like Hendra and Marburg is, you know, 60 to 80 percent. And even some of the other uh, coronavirus epidemics we've had, like MERS, estimated to be 34 percent fatal. Um, the bird flu is 39 percent fatal. And even the original SARS um, epidemic is about 10 percent fatal. So fortunately, the fatality rate of COVID-19 is a lot lower, but it is more infectious. And of course, it's really got all around the world. So it's not a good thing at the moment. Um, so there's a number of questions that arise. Where did this, how did disease 
arise, how did it jump from some other species into man, um, how, did, how may it have adapt, adapted to man once it was in man, and of course Darwinian evolution takes over then. So if there is um, a mutation in the virus and it's more infective than the previous version, it's likely to outcompete that very quickly. And as you know, we get a, a number of different mutants around the world now that are more infectious than the original one from January last year. So a number of key events, basically pretty much at the end of 2019, as you're aware, there's some strange pneumonias arose in Wuhan. Um, the seafood market, wet market, was um, identified quite quickly as being a potential source of, of this strange pneumonia. It was closed. The Chinese acted very quickly um, to try and contra contain this virus, as it happened with the previous coronaviruses, particularly things like SARS. Um, and that's actually been beneficial in the past with some of those nastier, more fatal um, coronavirus infections because people acted very quickly, they were able to draw a bit of a fence around them and stop them getting out and becoming pandemics. But unfortunately, in this case, the virus did escape. Um, I think there was a bit of a perfect storm. We had um, uh, a population, a country with a high population, and Wuhan is quite a large city. It has wet markets where exotic animals can mix with humans. Um, it was the Chinese New Year, where people from all over China travel back to their their relatives and um, celebrate and then go back to their home cities. So that was a great mixing event. Um, and also it was a big transport hub. So it's almost a perfect storm for spreading of a virus. So as you know, it's uh, become a terrible pandemic. It's had terrible uh, death rates, more morbidities, um, and of course it's had a huge impact on the world economy. So the latest um, figures I just looked up recently, there's about 167 million cases and 3.5 million deaths, which is likely to be a significant underestimate. So there's, if you draw this as a log-log plot, you tend to get um, a fairly constant relationship between the fatalities and the number of cases, which is um, represented by the case fatality rates, which are the the lines you can see, you maybe can see 40, 20 and so on, that's the fatality rate. And you can see it's going to sit around about 2% is where most of the, the line that most of the countries sit on. Um, Australia is sort of sitting down here. We were fortunate, we locked down very quickly and quite harshly as did New Zealand. And we managed to essentially eradicate the virus from the country. And the outbreaks we've had now have been fairly small because we're getting um, some quarantine lapses when we allow people come to come back to Australia from other countries where they're infected. Um, some of the worst cases, as you know, is the US. Um, very large number of cases, large number of fatalities. And interesting, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner here, um, and this is probably a bit out of date because it's, uh, I think, November or something, 23rd of November last year, but some of the countries that have done best have been countries that are islands, and that probably makes sense. And of course, Poland, there's around about almost 3 million cases and about 73,000 deaths, which is terrible, as most of Europe is. Uh, it's a bit of a correlation between the sort of the GDP of the country and the number of cases. I'm not sure. This is something I observed earlier on, but I suspect this correlation may break down because of the temporal phase of the virus moving around the world. We know India's, India thought they were going to get away lightly, but they've been hit very hard now and they've been hit late. So um, it's very hard to see if these correlations will persist, but they were interesting. And it may have maybe something to do with some of the countries with uh, low GDPs have large populations of young people, and they, young people are obviously much less susceptible. So um, first thing we wanted to look at is this question of where did the virus come from? People know that it's jumped from some animal species to humans, and, it, and there are a number of um, animals proposed. There's pangolins, there were bats, and there were snakes. Um, and bats were probably the most likely candidate because it's a bat coronavirus. It's quite similar to the current um, SARS-CoV-2, but there needed to be an intermediate animal for, to 
bridge between bats and humans. So what we thought we would do, and we had computational resources very kindly uh, given to us by the Oracle Cloud Systems and the Oracle Corporation has been very generous with their computational time and also with um, uh, a couple of people in Australia who have been extremely helpful in getting calculations running. We thought we'd try and do some um, computational calculations on the affinity of the spike um, protein on the coronavirus to its main target receptor, which is the um, angiotensin converting to uh, enzyme. And we tried to see if we can understand what animals may have been involved in the transmission and where humans stood in this, in this regime. So um, I actually got involved with this. I wasn't, I didn't initiate this, but um, Professor Nick Petrovsky, who has a company called Vaccine, who is actually, they make vaccines uh, quite successfully. They made a, a SARS coronavirus vaccine, which at the moment hasn't been commercialized but we do have a number of other candidates. Uh, Nick got me and a, a range of other people involved. Nick is a professor at Flinders University, which is, um, Marek mentioned, were people we collaborated with when we were um, doing the electron momentum spectroscopy work, uh, but this is in the medical school. So Nick um, was, is quite an entrepreneurial guy and he got a team of people together working on um, molecular dynamics and homology modeling and so forth to try and um, understand what was going on here. Um, <clears throat> so the question arises, the question arises, um, how did the virus cross from animals to humans? So it's, there's also the possibility, which can't be excluded, um, that there was an escape from the Wuhan Institute of Virology so no one really knows. Um, there's been, I guess, a bit of an active effort to um, not uh, canvas the escape from a lab um, situation, but I think um, we need to look at all possibilities because all of them are feasible. There's not enough evidence to exclude any of them at the moment, so we really need to follow that up. So there's a paper in Science recently by some very prominent scientists in this field um, saying that we really need to investigate all possibilities. Um, if the virus has jumped from bats to humans, there needs to be an intermediate animal. And at this stage, there's no viable intermediate animal that would explain the jump from bats to humans. Uh, and we don't have enough evidence to say whether or not there's been an accidental escape from a virology lab. So it's an open question. I think it's going to be explored more. So what, as I said, what we wanted to do is to look at the interaction of the virus, the very first interaction of the virus with humans, and that occurs from this um, spiky part of the virus called the spike protein, which interacts with the human um, angiotensin converting enzyme too. Okay, so we wanted to understand how this, um, this, um, the spike protein is interacting with ACE2. Once you get this interaction with ACE2, the virus is then able to attach to the cells. There's a fusion event that happens that allows the virus to enter the cell and infect the cell and we get viral replication. So we've, the work that I'm going to talk about has been on a preprint server for quite a while um, and it's also gone to Nature Scientific re Reports. Um, it's taken extremely long time to get this through Nature Scientific reports. It's been literally eight or nine months. So I don't understand why it's taken so long, but it's about to appear, I think. <clears throat> so we looked at a range of other um, animals that have coronaviruses, pangolin, the bat, SARS, SARS-CoV-2, the current one looked at the, um, the structure of the spike proteins and in particular the ligand binding domains, the part that interacts with the um, angiotensin converting to protein. So when we started this, which was very early last year, there was no three-dimensional structure of the spike protein available. Of course, there's quite a few structures. Structural biologists have done a very, very, very good job of um, 
making a lot of these structures available. But when we started this, there, were no, there was no three-dimensional structure for the spike protein. So we did a homology model initially. Um, and there's the technical details of how we did, which templates we used and how the homology model was built is described here. Um, we were able to build a th um, three-dimensional structure of the spike protein and the non-human angiotensin converting enzyme two proteins. Um, human was available, of course, but um, when we wanted to look at a range of other animals. So where we're coming from with this was to say, what's the susceptibility of the species that have been implicated as being potential intermediates in the transmission? And do we have to worry about other animals like companion animals, dogs, cats, birds, and farm animals like um, horses, sheep, pig, chickens, whatever, being a reservoir for the disease and potentially passing for us to pass the disease to them and then from them to pass it back to us, which would be rather disastrous. And as you're probably aware, um, I think late last year, there was a case where they had to kill all the minks in Scandinavia because humans had infected the minks and the minks were capable of infecting humans. So, so this is what you really need to know. What other animals are going to be implicated in this? So we had to build models of the ACE2 proteins for other species because there were no crystal structures available. So this is what we did with homology modeling. We used, uh, did this in the best way using the state of the art uh, methods that were available at the time. Um, evaluated the quality of the models extensively. And um, then we use molecular dynamics to um, look at the interactions. So um, just some more technical information about how we, so we wanted to be really sure that um, we were building the best quality models and where possible. Subsequently, some of the crystal structures appeared um, in the protein data bank and were able to use the crystal structures rather than the homology model structures. But what we did find was the homology model structures were extremely, were very, were very accurate because we had a good template to start with. Um, so this is what we said here. The spike was subsequently published and we've got very high structural similarity between our homology model spike protein structure and an electron um, microscopy structure, cryo-EM structure, um, which had an RMSD of 0.36 angstroms, which is very good. So if you look at the structure we built and the structure that we got from the crystal structure, they're almost identical. Um, not sure what's happened there. So with all of the um, angiotensin converting enzyme two structures that we built for different animals, and these are the animals we used here. We looked at bat because that was considered to be the origin species. We looked at cat, dog, because they're very common companion animals, cattle, um, horses and so forth, monkeys because they're, they're similar to humans, pangolin was another intermediate animal, snake was another intermediate animal. We looked at tiger because some tigers were infected in the US um, and civet and ferret are often used as, as um, experimental animals for these kinds of diseases. So we've got very good structures for all of these ACE2 um, proteins. So the complexes were subject to molecular dynamics because we used a human template initially to build the ACE2 structures and we, want, we were worried that there was some bias in the structures we were building because of the human template. So we're able to um, basically wash out any template induced bias using molecular dynamics. And then we tried docking the um, spike protein and the angiotensin converting enzyme two structures together using uh, Gromax. And we did the usual thing, immersed them in appropriate waters, uh, neutralized any charges and so forth, and looked at long range cutoffs. <clears throat> so the system was minimized without any restraints. We did some initial um, sort of minimization of the structure and then um, equilibrated the system under various regimes um, and then finally did production runs of MD simulation 
at sort of physiological temperatures um, to until we got convergence of the structures and then we did use uh, we calculated the binding energies the free energies binding of the spike protein and the ace2 proteins for each species so we did this as carefully as we possibly could um, we ran the, the, the calculations multiple times with different seeds and so forth to try and get an estimate of the accuracy of the um, binding energy interactions. So here's basically a summary of what we found. Um, so unsurprisingly, we found the humans had the highest affinity. And this is before the virus had actually been in the, in the community because you would expect a virus like a flu virus or a coronavirus to adapt to its hosts over time. And become um, more tightly bound but this was um, a structure that we had from the very very early part of the pandemic before the virus would have had time to adapt to its human host and surprisingly we found humans had the highest affinity pangolins were a little bit lower and then we had dog um, monkey hamster ferret um, and bat was quite a long way down bat was where people considered the virus originated and it needed to be passed through an intermediate animal which at this stage looks more, most likely to be a pangolin based on these calculations. But um, there are other things like um, snake, which was also considered a potential source of the coronavirus. And it was way, way down on the binding energy. So it seems very unlikely. And on the right hand side, I mean, because we, we've got no way of validating this, we looked at what's known in the literature of the infectivity of the virus for these different species. And we found we got a reasonable sort of qualitative correlation between the observed permissivity of infection and uh, degree of infection and the um, binding energies that were calculated between the spike and the ACE2 protein. So just seeing that as a graph, the human had the highest affinity and things like snake were way down on that. Um, it shows dogs were potentially infective, cats to a lesser extent. We know that hamsters and ferrets can be infected, and monkeys, of course. Um, this is just, um, I guess, a summary of the, um, the spike pangolin interactions versus the human structures, and just some quality measures there for those interested in molecular dynamics to show that we actually got a good homology structure and we got good um, convergence of the dynamics. We looked at the um, the binding residues between the spike and the ACE2 um, and we can see that just in this um, receptor binding domain that the ACE2 residues um, are reasonably well conserved um, and on the right hand side we can see the number of common residues. It was interesting that although the monkey had the same the same residues in the binding site, there were structural changes and the rest of the um, involved in the, the interaction outside of this receptor binding domain that meant that its affinity was lower than say in the case of pangolin, even though at hundred percent of the binding um, residues were the same with the pangolin. As you'll see second bottom there is only 63% of the common residues and yet it had almost as good a binding um, interaction as the human ACE2. Um, but most of the um, changes you see there, most of the, um, dif the differences are what you might consider to be conservative replacements. So they're probably going to have similar interaction energies to the human. So it was kind of interesting because we didn't really expect the human to come out on top because we would have thought of it if the virus has come from a bat, that probably bat would come out to be the top, um, possibly pangolin. So based on this information, you can't really exclude the possibility that the virus could have escaped from a lab. So we're not saying it did, but those calculations suggest that it could have come from a lab. So obviously further deliberations will have to be carried out, investigations to work out exactly how the virus um, crossed from the bat through either an intermediate animal or through being passaged through human cells in, in a virology lab and then escaping into the population. So the second thing we wanted to do was to, um, and, and this was really 
really important before we had vaccines is to see if we can use existing drugs to help patients in rather that are in a rather bad way, perhaps in intensive care in hospital with a COVID infection and potentially going to die. Whether there's anything we, anything in our existing 12,000 odd drugs that are registered that may be able to help this. And you're probably aware of the early work on hydroxychloroquine and then remdesivir and things like this some of which didn't actually work out and some of them promoted by um, various world leaders as being wonder drugs but in fact they weren't so as we said in the first half of the pandemic there were no vaccines or no effective drugs available so we were really back almost back to 1918 where we had just isolation hand cleaning masks were the things we could do to try and control this and actually do work pretty well. So we basically had to go back to what we did in 1918. But we realised if you're going to try and develop drugs for a coronavirus, particularly this one, if you're going to do this in the middle of a pandemic and drugs normally take 10 to 15 years to be discovered and go through the drug pipeline and receive registration, that's not going to work in a pandemic. You can't wait 10 to 15 years. And even if you were able to accelerate it like they were able to do with the vaccine, um, um, process, um, cutting it down from five years or so to less than a year, which is rather amazing. There still wouldn't be time to find a new drug and take it right through the clinical pipeline. There's about 12,000 registered drugs and clinical trial candidates and approved natural products that have been in man, where we understand their toxicity, their pharmacokinetics, their metabolism, etc. And if we could find something that our calculations told us is likely to be effective, um, then we could use, they could be used immediately because they have this um, this data in man that could be used as an emergency treatment. And as you know, some of the drugs like remdesivir have been. Um, in principle, you could do a high throughput drug screen on some of the targets for the virus, but um, that's not really tractable at the moment. Maybe for the time that the next pandemic comes along, we might have the robotics worked out where we can actually test 12,000 drugs in a short space of time and pick things out. But in the meantime, computational methods are becoming sufficiently accurate will enable us to get a short list of drugs from the 12,000 that are more likely to work. So here we looked at homology modeling, molecular docking, docking and molecular dynamics um, to try and, um, if you like, filter out the 12,000 registered drugs and identify the ones that are most likely um, to be effective. So, as to say, the SARS virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection cycle, the virus um, attaches to the ACE2 protein. It's a series of fusion events um, that allow the virus to, to enter the cell, and then there's a viral RNA release. There's a generation of these polypeptides, which are then cleaved into a number of non-structural proteins, about um, 10 or 20 of those, um, the RNA is replicated, the virus is um, reassembled and released. So there are this large number of um, non-structural proteins and we and many, many other people, as you're probably aware from the literature, uh, who do this sort of computational work decided to do what we did and jump in and look at a number of these um, targets like the spike protein and the main protease were two that were particularly looked at. So we looked at these as well, but we also looked at the RNA-directed RNA polymerase and a helicase um, enzyme as well, because these are all vital for the um, replication of the RNA and the replication of the virus. So this is a fairly traditional approach. We used, we had the structure of the protein targets the non-structural proteins I just mentioned. We've got the 12,000 drugs. We've got a pretty good docking um, algorithm, which is part of the Autodoc suite, which has been extensively validated. It seems to work very well for a, a wide range of wide diversity of um, molecular docking events of small molecules. We think we could then work out which of the 12,000 drugs that were docked into the protein target um, had the best docking scores and the best docking orientations and then we could take those and subject them to molecular dynamic simulation so we could get a much better estimate of the binding energy and the binding poses of those drugs and then we could actually calculate the binding 
interactions and then rank them accordingly. So I've just got a couple of examples here of the targets. Um, the papers are all out in preprint servers and some of them are about to come out in journals. I think there's one in um, um, molecular bio biomolecules and there's one in nature um, scientific reports. So the main protease, non-structural protein 5, was the first one we looked at. And um, so it cleaves a crucial peptide bond um, to release a number of the other proteins. So if you can inhibit this um, this inhibition, if you can inhibit this cleavage of, poly, of these polyproteins, um, you can actually disrupt the function of the virus pretty well and with probably minimal side effects from um, in humans. So um, I guess this is just coming down to the, the, the meat of it. Um, we, we end up with a short list of about 80 to 100 small molecules that had the best docking scores and the best um, molecular dynamics calculated um, binding interactions. And we've able to, been able to um, rank them here. Uh, we found, as you might expect, a number of antiviral drugs appeared on the top list, which was kind of encouraging because you expect antiviral drugs, particularly some that are known to have coronavirus activity, should be found. But we also found a number of rather interesting drugs like bincentivitinib, um, agotamine and things like that, that haven't shown up before um, that potentially um, useful drugs. So as I said, these have been um, written up and because um, one of the things we wanted to do, I've never actually done this before, but we thought it's very important to get this information out quickly. So as soon as we got the results, we basically wrote a paper and put it onto a preprint server. So the information was available to people um, and then we obviously worked through that and we we're getting um, peer reviewed papers coming out to follow that. So we can, it's all very well to make predictions and any of you that are computational people know you can do some really nice calculations, but I always feel uncomfortable if I can't stay close to the experiment. So I always try to work with people that will test predictions and hypotheses. So we weren't in the position to actually um, set up assays for the main protease of the virus or to the virus itself, obviously because of its infectivity and so forth. So we thought, how can we find out whether these predictions are any good? So you could, there's a website which you can go to where you, it'll show you um, a fairly broad spectrum um, picture of how some of these small um, drugs, and there's some antivirals here in this particular case, which particular viruses that might work on. So you can see that some of the ones that came up in our list um, have been shown to be active in MERS and SARS and SARS-CoV-2 and Zika virus and a number of other things. So what we did then was to get our list of 80 to 100 top candidates and we went in and, and we had this quite early on and subsequently there are all sorts of um, laboratory experiments being done and clinical trials being done and so forth on some drugs. So we went into the literature particularly the preprint literature, because um, that's where most people were putting their results very quickly to see if this 80 to 100 drugs that we came up with our shortlist, whether any of them might actually have activity as a kind of validation that our predictions had, had some value. So here's some examples of some of the ones that appeared towards the very top of our um, list of um, preferred drugs so out of the 12,000. And you can see bencentinib is in the phase two trial. It has pretty good activity against um, the virus in a couple of different cell types there. Um, it's also predicted to work on one of the other non-structural non proteins, non-structural protein 16 and 10. Um, Monoclast is a uh, has shown a significant reduction in the SARS virus in elderly asthmatic patients. Um, it's quite a few studies have predicted it will bind to the main protease. 
Uh, ritonavir is like a number of other antiviral compounds. It does show quite good in vitro activity. Of course, there's a big difference between in vitro and in vivo activity, as we know for things like remdesivir, which is very potent in vitro, but it doesn't work particularly well in patients. Um, but you can see there's been a number of, this one's going to multiple human trials and it does show significant in vitro activity and it's been predicted to be a binder to the main protease by a number of people apart from us. And remdesivir is probably the most famous one. It's been in multiple human trials. It's actually used in patients at the moment and it's actually found to be not particularly effective, but it can be very effective when it's coupled with other drugs. So I think that's still um, part of the therapeutic regime. But what we found was with the main protease that of the 87 top predicted drugs that we had, that 25% of them actually had validated um, experimental activity. So we felt that our computational method was capable of identifying biologically active molecules. Of the other 75%, it doesn't mean they were inactive and the predictions were wrong, it just means that most of them haven't been tested. So if in fact all of those are tested, we may find that the hit rate goes up to perhaps 50%, which is pretty good. Um, the second one was the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, non-structural protein 7. And again, we did a similar thing. This is involved in um, the replication of the, the um, RNA. I've got a DNA slide here, but it's a similar kind of thing. Um, so if you can disrupt the polymerase, and again, you can disrupt the RNA replication. And again, um, a number of things that appeared in our top hit, either antivirals or other interesting molecules that wouldn't normally be considered to have antiviral activity, actually do have activity against MERS and SARS and SARS-CoV-2. So our short list here, I'm just showing a few of them, but there is about as I said, between 80 and 100 in our top list. And there's a number of antivirals you can see there. It's probably about four or five antivirals on the list. But there's some really interesting things. Ivermectin came up, which has again been shown to have activity. I think Monash University people first showed that. Bencentinib, which showed up on our um, MPRO um, screen, also showed up here, remdesivir similarly. So some of them may have multiple activity against multiple targets, which is a very useful thing for any therapeutic. Um, and you've got things like digoxin and so forth that came up on the list as well. Um, again, we wanted to go back and say, well, predictions are all fine, but we'd like to see, get some sort of experimental validation that the predictions have some value. So again, we went into the literature and we found things like ivermectin, for instance, have got quite good IC50s against the virus in monkey kidney cells. Uh, digoxin um, has actually really good IC50 values in vero cells against the virus. Um, Gladysphere is in clinical trials and it's um, also an RDRP inhibitor which we predicted and it actually has been shown to be an RDRP inhibitor. In this case we've got over 30 percent of our 80 top predicted compounds have been experimentally validated as of January. Um, there may be more of them by now. So the other 70%, as I said, may not necessarily be inactive. They may have just not been tested. So that's a pretty good hit rate to show that um, we make a prediction of 80 compounds, 80 drugs out of our re repurposing list of 12,000. And we find um, a satisfyingly large percentage of them have actually experimentally validated activity. And the last one we look at is the helicase. Again, this is involved in um, the separating of the strand before it's replicated. And if you can disrupt that, you can disrupt the um, viral replication. So again, we have a list of 80 to 100 in the short list, and this is some of the top hits. And again, a number of antiviral compounds show up, as you might expect. And that's kind of satisfying in a way, because if you found no antiviral compounds in your list, then it might seem a little bit unusual. You would expect to see some of them, because some of them are known to hit the, some of these protein targets or some of these viruses. Um, and again, um, some of the 
Well, here we've got a, an antiviral compound and one of the more unusual compounds that wouldn't be considered antiviral normally, but um, menipidine is actually showing um, reasonably broad spectrum activity against West Nile, Zika virus, CMV, dengue, so forth. So just a few of our top 10 repurposed drugs. Um, there is a, a citrus flavonone, asperidine, that um, is very interesting. It, it's got quite, it's been predicted to be, um, or predicted to, to be a helicase activity. It hasn't been tested for that, but in fact does show sort of moderate macrodiase inhibition. Um, there's a vasopressin inhibitor that also shows quite good activity against the virus in a, a couple of different cell types. Um, Manipidine, which showed up before, it's a calcium um, channel blocker, antihypertensive, but it's showing again moderate activity against the virus in a number of different assays. And there's an antiviral compound, tepranavir, which um, is also showing um, moderate activity in against the virus in in vitro assays. And again, we had approximately 30% of our 87 top predicted repurposing hits have actually been experimentally validated in the literature as of March. So the other 70%, some of that other 70% have not been tested and may show some activity as well. But again, we, in the three main protein targets that we looked at, we're getting a really um, satisfyingly high experimental validation rate for the predictions. So that gives us quite a degree of confidence that this method, which can be carried out quite rapidly if you have good computational resources, can rapidly zero in on um, drugs that are potentially useful for pandemics. Hesperidine is particularly interesting, that citrus um, flavonone um, that I've mentioned, because it seems to be able to hit a number of different targets. It's, the people have shown that it can be implicated in the interaction of the spike with the, the ACE2 receptor. It can interfere with the proteolysis step, the polypeptide breakdown from, through the main protease. It also has effects on oxidative stress and apoptosis in cells, often in conjunction with vitamin C. Um, so there's a number of cellular and systemic events that this particular drug may work at. So it, it's an interesting natural product um, hit that we found. So in summary, we've shown that um, our computational methods can predict the binding affinities of the spike for the ACE2 protein in diverse species. And the binding affinity is broadly consistent with the observed animal susceptibilities that have been, been noted in the literature, in the medical literature. Surprisingly, the human ACE2 interaction has the highest affinity and pangolin is the next and lower one and bat is much lower. So um, that is a little bit surprising if the um, virus had come from one of those animals. So as I said, there's two main ways it could happen. The bat could, the bat could have passed the virus to an intermediate animal and then to humans. But despite extensive searches, there's no the intermediate animal hasn't yet been found. Not to say it can't be found, but so far it hasn't been found. It's, it's also possible that it could be an accidental escape from a virology lab. When the, um, the WHO um, World Health Organization team went to Wuhan to look at this, they considered it unlikely, but they kind of recanted when they got out of China and said that, well, we can't really exclude it. In fact, um, the Director General said that he really thinks this question hasn't been properly um, addressed. So I guess our calculations are providing a bit, little little um, chunk of additional information that could be useful to try and track down what's happening with the virus. It's also useful for looking at susceptibility of animals so that we're making sure that there aren't any um, viral pools hanging around that could um, catch us in the future. And we've been able to identify between 80 and 100 re drug repurposing candidates for each of the three molecular targets um, that are potential drugs and could be put directly into humans. And we've got a, at least a 30% validation rate on our predictions from experiment, which is, um, I think, um, very suggestive that the method is, is worth using in a pandemic environment because it's likely to be yielding things that are potentially useful um, for use in patients.
that's what I've said there. So just some, I mean, obviously I didn't do all of this work or some of this work. Um, Oracle Cloud Systems were very generous in giving us grants of supercomputing time and Peter Wynn and uh, Dennis Ward from Oracle Cloud Systems were very, very helpful. They were working with us very closely in all the calculations, making sure everything was running well, that the codes were optimised and so forth. Um, vaccine, Nick Petrovsky's company, provided financial support for the project. Um, Sakshi Peplani and Panit Singh um, did basically did the MD calculations, homology model calculations as part of the team. Um, Nick, uh, I'd like to acknowledge because he really got the whole thing off the ground and it was really satisfying, mostly as you know as a scientist, you go and do your experiments, you get perhaps some interesting observations, but if you're in the biological space, it can be 10, 15 or 20 years between a, a really promising um, piece of new research can get to the clinic. Um, so it is really satisfying to be working on a project that is an, of immediate use. So we think you're working on this for a year and the results could be immediately applied to patients. And we also had a lot of help from Harinda uh, Rajapaksha, who was at La Trobe and did such a good job that Oracle recruited him into the supercomputing group because he did some invaluable work on um, speeding up the algorithms substantially. And also he was very he was a very good sounding board for the um, the analysis of the results because he was a, a fairly critical guy and if there's anything it's slightly wrong or if the calculations had been, you know, taken any shortcuts, he would make sure that um, we went back and repeated them uh, as rigorously as we possibly could. So I'm very grateful to those people. Um, Pacific Chem, I've been involved with that for a while. It's the world's biggest chemistry congress. Um, I've been involved with about 15 years. We get about 18 to 20,000 people, but this year, well, actually it was supposed to be last year, but it was um, put off till this year and it's now going to be a hybrid conference, but it's a very good um, meeting to get to if you can get to it or at least to pretend, attend virtually. So I'd just like to thank you for um, your interest in this work and um, I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. <clears throat> So, Thank you, Dave. You can see some that was, uh, that was uh, yes. a really excellent uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, Dave, if you uh, check uh, chat on, on the sidebar. Okay. I can see that now. From Jacek Kolanowski, if you could please. Uh, and uh, everybody can, can, can see this, uh, those questions. Um, yeah, I think the first one about um, doing biophysical experiments with the spike and ACE2, I think it would be terrific if someone was actually able to um, carry out those those measurements. So I suppose you could do it with AFM or, or a bunch of other methods to actually work out, and do experiments to work out what the binding energies are. Um, and then we could compare that with our calculated binding energies. That would be very helpful. Is that what the question's about? Um, do you know anything about the number and abundance of ACE2 like receptors in other species in comparison to humans? Um, well, we know in humans that the ACE2 receptor is quite widely distributed. It's in lung, um, it's in vascular tissue, it's in a whole range of different things, heart, uh, even the brain. Um, and that, that probably explains why people get some quite strange. Um, and diverse uh, medical problems when they get infected with the virus and, and some of the long-term implications when you get over the virus. It can take people many months sometimes to get their sense of taste and smell and the brain fog and so on to go away. So um, I would imagine in primates that the distribution of the ACE2 receptors would be probably roughly similar to humans, but um, I couldn't really say with some of the lower animals, particularly things like reptiles and so forth, but I imagine for, um, for mammals, even um, dogs, cats and um, horses and so forth, the physiology is probably not so sufficiently different that the ACE2 receptor would be, the distribution would be similar I would imagine, but that's just my speculation. <clears throat> 
uh, there's a second one about the estimated error of your MD calculation on the binding energies. Um, yeah, the statistical significance, it's in the paper, I think it was, uh, it was significant at 97%. 97, I think, percent percentile, and it'd um, be nice to get it to three or five sigma, but uh, we didn't get that. Um, so we did do a statistical test. We were able to do, because we were able to do the calculations multiple times with different seeds, we were able to get an estimate on the um, variability of the um, binding energy estimates, and it's actually in one of the tables I showed, there was uh, um, some um, um, variance on that. But we did a statistical test and we found that it was significant at the 97% um, confidence interval. Uh, what else have we got? Um, so the SARS-2 has a large RNA genome. It's known to be structured. Some of the elements are very much conserved across species, pointing to their um, functional relevance. Uh, comment on the viral genomic RNA as a drug target. It's probably outside my pay grade. I'm not really a virologist, so I probably couldn't contribute much to that. Uh, and whether drugs would be repurposed or new. Okay, I think I covered that. We really need to look at repurposed drugs because there are the 12,000 um, drugs out there. We know that drugs, um, no drug is it's a single target drugs hit multiple targets, and that can sometimes be an advantage. Um, so it's a matter of saying, is there an off-target effect um, from an existing drug that might have been developed as antihypertensive, for instance, but is there one that shows useful antiviral activity against this virus? So um, repurposing is the only approach you have at the moment, because if you wanted to start from scratch and look at the and the other way to do it is to do a de novo approach. We say, all right, well, here's the main protease. We've got the X-ray structure. We know everything about it. We can design a purposely built drug to interact very tightly with this binding site rather than just relying on whatever we can get. And in fact, one of the major drug companies, I think, has is, is put a drug in, into clinical trial extremely quickly based on that. They've actually done a de novo design of a drug into the binding site of the main protease. Um, non-structural protein 5. Um, so they've done that in less than a year. And so probably I'm not sure how long it'll take to get through the initial trials, but they may, in two to three years, they might have something, if the drug works, they might have something that'll work that was actually designed de novo. But usually for a pandemic, because of the time constraints, you really need to use something that's already there. And of course, you do have to worry about the off-target off effects. So it's a bit like emergency use of anything. If you have a drug that might be useful in cancer, but the side effects are not well understood. Sometimes if for people that are in a um, you know, stage four cancer and don't have a very good prognosis, they can, you can use it, you can do more experimental assessments um, in clinical trials in those compassionate sort of cases than you can with more healthy patients. So I think um, for a little while, we're going to have to stick with repurposed drugs. So the computational resources, um, heavens, um, I was trying to remember that. We had a lot of, um, a lot of resources given to us by um, Oracle Cloud. I think we had 64 GPU, no, was it 64? It's in the paper, I'd have to refer to it actually. I might have to um, just, either go to the, re the preprint servers or um, I can, if you send me your email address, I can send you the details onwards with that. Um, the first image I had ACE2 and spike glycosylated. Um, yeah, well obviously glycosylation is important. We had to take the glycosylation into, a, into account. Um, but when you look at the crystal structures, there are crystal structures of the spike interacting with the um, human ACE2 and um, the glycosylation in the receptor binding domain doesn't seem to be significant, obviously, because you don't want to glycosylate anything in the receptor binding domain. So yeah, glycosylation is always um, a bit of a nightmare. I don't think it's fully understood at this stage. 
but I think there's um, enough information on on glycosylation along the interactions between the spike and ACE2 um, to enable us to do some rational design and that's in fact what the drug companies have done for this, um, this clinical trial candidate but it certainly needs to be taken into account. There are other non um, there are other sites. There's a fatty acid binding site that's also um, available on the spike protein, which is of great interest. The spike protein has two different conformational states, the so-called open and closed state, and the open state is required to interact with ACE2. And they found that um, there's a fatty acid binding site on the um, spike that can cause the spike to remain in the closed position much longer than it would normally be, which would mean it would reduce infectivity because the open the open um, form is required for interacting with ACE2. So there's other um, spike binding interactions there that can be um, looked at as well. People have also looked at saying, can you inhibit the ACE2 receptors? Can you compete with the spike for the ACE2 receptors? So your drug goes in, fills up all the ACE2 binding sites and the, um, the virus can't attach. But the virus has pretty good affinity, so you'd have to have a very high affinity drug. It also, if you're inhibiting human um, receptors or enzymes in this particular case, they're likely to have um, obvious side effects in humans. And the angiotensin um, converting enzyme 2 is uh, a known target for um, antihypertensive drugs. So there may be effects on blood pressure and so forth. <coughs> Uh, see if there's any more questions. Dave, I have a question, if, if you let yep. me. Uh, sure. This is uh, sort of uh, extremely politically uh, incorrect. Assuming, oh, assuming that uh, it is possible that uh, the, this virus uh, was constructed synthetically by humans, what sort of incredible insight uh, would uh, be necessary to 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 sort of synthetically create something that will have uh, such a such a high affinity and, and, and binding properties what sort of prior knowledge you would have to you know have launching on that's that kind of uh, of course it's not entire organism is not synth synthetically sort of created so even to modify it to to be so effective what sort of you know incredible knowledge you would have to possess to to do this sort of thing? Well, I think with things, yeah, I mean, genetic engineering is, is really good these days. And there have been a number of papers that have come out that is, well, initially people said, could this have been a synthetically constructed virus or could it have been manipulated to have a, um, a furin? The critical thing about this particular virus is it has a, a furin um, residue that's um, critical to the virus function that the animal ones don't tend to have. That people thought could that have been engineered in um, but from my understanding and I'm not a molecular biologist it's hard to do that without leaving some kind of a fingerprint of manipulation in there and there just seems to be from what I've read anyway not really not much evidence of, of deliberate manipulation so if if, the, if it has come from a lab it's almost certainly a, an accidental release and just recently they said there were some people at Wuhan who worked in the lab who became ill with um, COVID-like symptoms about a month before the, the virus took hold in Wuhan. So I don't know if that's correct, but that's what's been coming through the media. So it's possible that, um, see there was a, there was some Chinese um, workers affected by a bat virus and its potential, um, this was a few months before, it's potentially correct that you know, most people, if there's an illness around, people like to do research on it, they want to understand it, they want to work out how to knock it out or to deal with it if it becomes a problem. So it's probably a legitimate um, study in a virology lab. Um, and I think the Wuhan um, virology lab is actually funded at least in part by the Gates Foundation and things like that. So, you know, it's a, quite a respectable virology lab and it's possible they were working on the virus, so passaging the virus through human cells. The virus became adapted to human cells, so its affinity for the human ACE2 grew, 
and became stronger than it would have been for a bat or a pangolin or something. And then it's possible that a worker could have been infected, um, even um, non-symptomatic infection, which some people have, and it's gone out into the community in Wuhan and the very high population density and it's, the virus has taken off from there. So um, that's one possible scenario. I think there's very little evidence that it's been a de deliberate manipulation, like a you know germ warfare kind of weapon. I think there's very little evidence for that, but um, there's not enough evidence to exclude the possibility that it did escape from a virology lab in, in China. I guess that means that I'll probably never be able to go to China again. I'll never get a visa for China again for saying that. But anyway, <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. But I think it is feasible. It is possible for people to manipulate the virus to make it more infective. So that's very scary. Yeah. I'm not saying it happened now, but it's scary in general that you have the capability to do that. Thank you very much. It looks like uh, they've answered all the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, I tried to. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dave, for, for this fascinating le uh, lecture. Uh, very thorough work uh, covering so so much ground. Uh, in con in con concluding, I, I wish to remind our uh, listeners that uh, in July uh, you are all invited to participate in free online event, our seventh edition of Supercomputing Frontiers Europe. There will be a range of uh, different topics covered, not necessarily COVID, but uh, Lots of fascinating uh, topics, uh, including artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, very large scale molecular, ab initial molecular computing, and uh, supercomputing technologies, as always. Uh, you are welcome. Uh, the submission date for, for the papers is still open. So if you uh, yourself or your, your, your colleagues, uh, people from your circles, uh, students uh, wish to submit papers we are welcoming all sub uh, new submissions uh, again to remind you that icm has been involved in COVID research for for, for at least 15 months and uh, we have a very powerful epidemiological model for poland uh, where and the results are published uh, almost daily on our website uh, if you're interested please uh, uh, visit uh, our website uh, there are two uh, lectures uh, at the previous uh, seminars uh, recorded and so if you wish to revisit this and, and listen to what the what uh, what are particular interests of our uh, colleagues uh, at ICM in their research uh, you know, again most welcome to uh, to see those uh, lectures uh, and finally uh, so there's there's a lot more of of, of uh, of uh, lectures on different topics and finally i wish to acknowledge the uh, support of various media partners and uh, sponsors and supporters and uh, with that thank you very much for for being with us attending this uh, very fascinating seminars and uh, have a great day thank you very much bye bye <laughs>